welcome everybody uh, to today's Sawanaga Science, Science event. Uh, Sawanaga Science is uh, an annual Halloween inspired mini festival created by uh, the Dublin Institute for Advanced Studies or DIAS. Um, and it's in its fourth year now. Uh, and the idea is that it brings together the researchers from the different disciplines within DIAS, uh, Celtic Studies, theoretical physics, which uh, I'm a part of, and uh, cosmic physics, uh, which incorporates astronomy, astrophysics, and uh, geophysics. And the idea is that uh, in Samanaga Science, we'll bring together these different disciplines to create a series of free events uh, to mark the ancient feast of Samhain, which, uh, as many of you are probably aware, that uh, forms the basis of modern Halloween. And this year, the theme for Sawanaga Science is exploring the dark side of science and Celtic heritage. Uh, for today's event, we have Sonnets for Samhain. And uh, <clears throat> as well as myself, we have uh, the poet and physicist Iggy McGovern, uh, who's going to present a selection of uh, poems from his most recent book, Making Waves, a sonnet sequence based on the life of Erwin Schrodinger. Um, and uh, I'll just introduce Iggy first. He's a fellow emeritus uh, in the School of Physics at Trinity College Dublin. He's published several collections of poetry, uh, The King of Suburbia, The uh, Safe House, The Eyes of Isaac Newton. Uh, a Mystic Dream of Four is a sonnet sequence based on probably the most famous uh, Irish mathematician, uh, William Rowan Hamilton. Um, he, his awards include the Ireland Chair of Poetry Bursary, the Glenn Dimplex New Writers Award for Poetry, and the Hennessy Literary Award. Uh, and now today he's going to present yes, a, a selection uh, of some of his most recent poems, poems based on Schrodinger's life. Um, before starting, I just uh, want to mention that if anyone has any questions, you can use the Q&A box throughout the talk and we'll try and get to some at the end. And if anyone's on Twitter, then we invite you to tweet about today's event using the hashtag Dias Discovers. Um, so with that, uh, I think I'd first just like to ask Iggy um, how you went from physics to poetry. What was your journey? You mentioned something about the dark side earlier, and I wonder which is which is the darker, so physics or the poetry. Um, yes, uh, um, on my, well, my journey is, is part, uh, triggered by uh, domestic, domesticity in some ways. Uh, um, um, I, my wife, I, at some point just said, "Go out and become interesting." I thought being a physicist was really interesting, but apparently only to physicists or to in some general way. I so agree. I, that. Yeah. I went out to uh, uh, to to um, to kind of a night class to see what I you know maybe I could take up something more interesting, <laughs> and uh, and uh, of course uh, all the all the physics type things were full up you know car maintenance and things like that they were all full up but. Creative writing had a few, few slots, and I took up uh, this, uh, and it was wonderful. It was a, a great, a great ex experience, and um, it did have kind of interesting um, sort of projections because I, I'd, I'd always thought I might be able to write stories. And uh, at the end of this course, I, we got um, we all got little report cards, like at, like at school, and uh, mine said. Uh, you will never be a short story writer, <laughs> but you might try poetry. <laughs> it's kind of an interesting way of looking at it. So I did, and um, and uh, I went on to become very interested in it and very took part in it in, to all sorts of degree. And, and you, you started with uh, with Hamilton, was it? Or no, by no means. Uh, uh, in fact, I, I I stayed away from the physics in the, in the poetry. I, I really didn't do that, and uh, partly because I was unsure how that would be received, uh, and and say also the first time I did try it, I made a mistake. I made a, a physics mistake. Uh, yeah. Almost like was saying, just don't do this. 
No, no, the Hamilton uh, 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 book came much, much later. And it was really as a result of giving a lecture, giving the lecture about Hamilton in Trinity College for the, uh, you know, the, the annual big lecture. And, um, and I had all this information about Hamilton, which I hadn't, hadn't didn't know before. And I thought, well, this is something that could be put into a, a, into a series of, of, of um, poems. Uh, and I chose the, the sonnet form for these because it's a very good way of delivering a lot of information in a very short space. And if you choose the, uh, the 4442 system, as we say, <laughs> you have basically, you know, four lines, four more lines, four more lines, and then two lines. And so you have three major things that you can say, one in each of the four line uh, uh, stanzas, if you like. And uh, then um, you've got the, the last two lines to either agree with all of it or to say something quite different, you know, that sort of thing. So it's a lovely, it's a lovely way of doing this type of uh, thing. I got a bit uh, carried away by the, uh, Hamilton's uh, quaternions, which are these, this, these famous um, uh, uh, sort of vector plus, plus one more. Uh, and uh, so I ended up doing a, a, using the concept of four and uh, all mm. over this, including uh, the title, Mystic Dream of Four. Um, four uh, there were uh, four sections and there were, uh, there were uh, 64 poems in all, four to the power of three. So, yeah. yeah so, <laughs> so that was that. Was that. And I've come back to that idea of uh, doing, uh, um, you know, taking a, a scientist and particularly a scientist who wrote poetry, as Hamilton did, and doing, mm -hmm. doing it on another scientist who wrote poetry. And that's yeah. Owen Schrodinger. Yeah. And that's why we're that's why we're here today. Almost. <laughs> yeah. And of course, uh, Schrodinger was also the first director of Dias. So that's how you know Dias is involved in all of this for oh. anyone who was wondering. Um, and, and so you mentioned the structure of the the Hamilton book. So um, maybe you could give us a, a short description then, or, or layout of the, the Schrodinger book. Yeah, well, it's, it's, uh, uh, there are some similarities uh, uh, in that uh, there it will be the four 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 two structure of each uh, of each poem. The uh, the big difference is is, is that uh, it it was coincident that the dividing uh, uh, Hamilton's life into four equal time zones uh, actually corresponded to uh, uh, the actual poems that I was trying to write or maybe the other way around. So I didn't, but I didn't have any sort of guidance like that here. There's no fourness involved. There's no kind of number mm -hmm. of that. So I chose just to say, I'm going to have 50 people and I'm going to divide them up into five tens and for no other reason than, than just that was, <laughs> yeah. I think, kept some element of numbering, but you know, it was convenient to the to the to the material I had, and um, then um, the 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 idea is that these are not equal time zones; um, they're quite variable. Uh, but they what makes them kind of cohere, if you like, is that they're 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 setting. So they're either setting in one particular place like Vienna uh, or in a pair of places like uh, Zurich and Berlin. So that's really what is the structure of this, uh, of, of this, um, these five. Yeah. So, you know, when I come to talk about that, we're, we're going to pick one poem from each of the, uh, uh, mm -hmm. the uh, I know the, the, you can hear the cry calling for all, give us all 50 of them, please. <laughs> but uh, we're, we're just going to pick, pick we've agreed uh, one poem uh, from each of the five. Uh, so, um, and then a little chat will come, arise from that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, all right, then uh, maybe we should jump on into it. Yeah, um, I was thinking at, at this stage that maybe that I could get rid of the, the slogan on my T-shirt. Uh, oh, yes. If yeah. people can't see it, it says, uh, uh, Schrodinger's cat is alive, but it's broken up. The alive word is broken up into to give you some sense of, uh, well, is he really alive? 
Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So I can. I'll. I'll just move my uh, my uh, camera and. Uh, um, so, all right, so the first poem from, from part one of your book that we uh, thought would yes. be good is um, Schrodinger's Mother. It's Schrodinger's uh, Mother, and um, uh, so and her, her name is Georgina Schrodinger, nay Barr. Barr was her, her maiden name. My husband and I shared a common fate. Just two years old when Rudolf's mother died, and I lost mine when I was not yet eight. Which may have made it easy to decide that he should be our best and only child. No sister who would teach him gentleness, no brother fit to tame a temper wild, and yet there was no shortage of redress. By way of sister, he had one of mine, just 13 years his elder, less an aunt, and brother-wise, if he should cross a line, his father was no stranger to the rant. Such memories as down an English hill, my mansion learns to ride, a bicycle. So uh, <laughs> maybe some things needing some small explanation. Yeah, I, I have also the book here as well, I should mention. And it contains nice little uh, bits of info there at the bottom of each poem. But um, you, uh, you mentioned that he was learning to ride a bicycle. And mm -hmm. of course, he was like an avid cyclist, I guess. Um, uh, actually, we uh, uh, should mention this as well, that recently we also opened up the Schrodinger cycle around Dublin, um, which is something you can find on the Dias website, um, which has a, a bit more info about his, his time in Dublin and his uh, route through up from Clintarf down to the uh, first uh, office of Dias in Marion Square. Um, <clears throat> But uh, you um, you mentioned uh, the other the other day you also had some some anecdotes about uh, Schrodinger and his bike. Um, uh, yes, yes, indeed. Uh, um, I, I came to Trinity in um, 1979, so this is long past the, in some sense, the the, the Schrodinger time in in Dublin, and. Um, and I just happened uh, by chance to uh, I'd be talking one day to the, the uh, chief technician in the physics department, and he he was he was he was not young, and I, I thought perhaps this is somebody who who knew Schrodinger, and uh, so I said uh, it was Jimmy Bennett was the name, lo lovely man. I said Jimmy, do, do you remember anything about Erwin Erwin Schrodinger? And his, he, his face immediately darkened, and, and he said, Schrodinger, he said, I was ever after that fellow for by parking his bike in the hallway of the department. So there, there it goes. It's, uh, you know, it, your Nobel Prize winner on one hand, chief technician yeah. <laughs> on the other hand. There's no, no doubt about who, win, who wins there. You know, so. No, yeah, we, we, in, our, in our short time of researching him and cycling around, we also came. He seems to be, you know, pretty eccentric with his, the way he uses his bike. He would also jump off over the handlebars, swing his legs over the handlebars to dismount the bike. He didn't want to do anything the ordinary way. No. Um, <laughs> you said uh, his, his father was no stranger to the rant, so his... Um, his dad as well. I wondered if you want to uh, talk about his yeah, relationship the, there, or the the, the parent the two the parents were quite different. Uh, they, they, the 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 mother was very uh, you know interested in music and, and 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 sort of I think was fun was was part of her her personality as well. His father I think was more uh, serious. Uh, 
and maybe a man uh, sort of not 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 entirely happy with his situation. He he was uh, he was basically running a, a linoleum linoleum factory. If anyone knew, remembers linoleum, <laughs> it's, a, it's a floor covering, and uh, uh, that was his that was his. Uh, his business and job, but really, what he wanted to be uh, uh, was a botanist and, and other out, an outdoors man uh, uh, as well, you know. So, um, uh, and I think some of that possibly, you know, passed on to the his son. Uh, it just seems to be a place point of contact uh, that they because he, he had a microscope, and uh, so mm -hmm. Erwin and, and his friends would come get the chance to use the microscope, yeah. So, uh, um, and I think uh, uh, something we talked a little bit about, uh, I think you could reasonably say that that had some consequences uh, much, much later on. When, uh, and we'd be talking a little bit about that when, uh, when Schrodinger writes his famous book, the What is Life? And uh, mm -hmm. the whole idea of, uh, well, ultimately, which ends up with the, the, the suggestion of the structure of DNA. Yeah, yeah. So, so I think, yeah. Um, he was much more interested in, or he had more of an interest in, like the natural world or something than other yes. physicists around him. Yeah, yeah, I think that I think that's true indeed. I thought just before we went sort of off the uh, that uh, particular uh, the the business of the bicycles, I always thought it'd be a great sort of a, a, you know quiz question of where did Schrödinger learn to ride a bike? And you think mm. well, you know well. Uh, Schrodinger, where was he? Where was he? Oh yeah, Vienna. When do you learn to ride a bike? But in fact, he learned to ride it in in Leamington Spa in England. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Which is, you know, and in fact, there was a the, the reason was that his mother would have been um, his grandmother was was from from Le Leamington Spa, and they so they and they, they, the families kept the, the connection very strong and and. and Schrodinger was spoke English with his with his with his mother. And, yeah, and his English, of course, was was perfect. You know, perfect. Oh, that that just made me think as well. Of uh, there's a recording of him on the BBC, and I remember thinking that he had almost a, an English accent. Yes, yes. And that, that could be from his time in you know all these high level academic institutions. Uh, but um, yeah, maybe from a, you know having from a young age a strong mm -hmm. grasp of English. Absolutely, um, yes. Yeah. That recording is an interesting thing to look up for as well for anybody who hasn't heard it before. Mm -hmm. um, all right, uh, sh shall we move on to part two? Ah, yes, well, part two uh, is, uh, apart from what she said, was about, about childhood, and obviously that was all about, uh, goes all the way up to, to Lee Leaves, uh, his um, sec secondary school, I guess we'd say. Uh, part two then is, all about his time at the uh, at the university, or largely at at the university, and uh, so it goes from nineteen oh six to nineteen twenty one. Yeah. So, and it's as I say, it's at the university except for three years, uh, where he was involved uh, either in training in the military, that was his call up, mm. if you like, and then there were a couple of years when he actually was on the on the Italian front as a in the right. art artillery officer. I think. Yeah. Where where was where was that? Sorry. Oh gosh, where indeed? Uh, I know it was on the Itali uh, Italian front, which is oh where, Italian front. Oh right, Italian front. Yes, yes. Uh, but I can't remember the name of the uh, the place. Uh, I mean, he he he. I suppose in some sense he had an easier war than most in that uh, first world war, uh, and uh, you know, as long as they didn't fire back, uh, you, uh, artillery people were fairly uh, fairly. Yeah. Sad. Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, we had thought to read um, the a poem about Franz Exner. Yes, yeah. I've read that uh, properly. Yeah, uh, Franz Exner was the professor of uh, essentially experimental physics in the uh, oh. university, and uh, I think well, it was also head of the, the physics institute, which is the that part of the, the university. Uh, I have um, Franz, uh, there he is, indeed. Yeah. He strikes me as somebody with a sense of humour. Uh, <laughs> and one of the elements that I've included in the poem is the fact that he was constantly harping on about the fact that 
when he was appointed, they said they'd build him a new institute. And 20 years later, he was still asking them, where is the institute, you know? So I thought that, that that's, it didn't sound out of place at all in modern universities either, yeah. So um, he was, um, I mean, Ehrman was uh, obviously a star, star pupil and, uh, and um, he would end up actually as doing his research work with, with Exner, uh, which is interesting in, in a way. I'll, I'll maybe explain a little bit more about that. Uh, so here, here's Exner's then. Exner is the voice of this poem. If farmers happy is the joke headline, it's one we physicists could also wear. It took them 20 long years to design the institute they promised with my chair. He came top of his class with easy flair. His project showed innate ability when measuring the impact of moist air on insulator conductivity. I'm glad he took up my assistantship, which duties he embraced wholeheartedly. With this access, he managed to equip himself to show his red anomaly. I think he may prefer the lighter touch of theory and it doesn't cost as much. So I guess the, the two strange things in that is, what's this red anomaly? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, that's basically, Exner was an expert in, in, in color theory, which is a strange, strange beast. And I've, I, I, I've tried to read through it and, and, and I must say, I'm no, I'm no further on, but, but, but they were basically on trying to understand, uh, you know, and, and, link, and, then, and it was a, a, an area of, linked up very close with art. So the old idea of, of color and, uh, and they were working off uh, the, the, that the idea that there were three primary colors, the, the red, green, and blue, although they didn't know why, they, you know, but that was, that, was, that was the theory indeed. So uh, he, uh, Schrodinger got involved in this, uh, and, and as I said, did the experiment on himself to, to, to end up with the result that he had more, more red sensitivity than he should have had. I think oh, right. really what we would say now is that he had less green sensitivity than that. I think that would be the more way that we would probably probably describe it. But I don't he quite literally saw the world differently than others. Yeah, people. basically, yeah. <laughs> but he made quite a name for himself in this color theory area. Uh, as I say, I find it hard to understand exactly what was going on. And, but the one thing I did find interesting was that he was using affine. Is that the correct word to describe? A f f i n e affine. 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 Uh, I I know that word from a maths context. And that's like, that's exactly what he was doing. Uh, that's a, the geometry. It's a way of describing. Oh geometry right, okay. And the, the bulk standard way, and of course this uh, affine geometry was also the way he would end up in trying to do deal with um, unified theory later on. But oh, interesting. Right. So I, that's the sort of connection I, I would make out of, out of that. So, yeah. Um, I don't think there was anything other than that, uh, except that it does lead on um, to, um, to uh, Einstein. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you, yeah one, that was one thing that struck me was that how he started more on the experimental yeah. side. Um, and you mentioned that uh, in your book, uh, they had a stronger sense of the physical world and uh, similar to Einstein, actually. Yeah. Because um, most theoretical physicists are, I guess, coming more from the mathematical side. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I know. I thought that was interesting. Indeed, yeah. And I think, it, and of course, it works uh, in, in, in the opposite direction as well. Uh, if if you have that sort of balance, uh, it also means that you're not maybe such a hot shot mathematician. Yeah, 
and uh, as you, as you know, uh, uh, most people know that both both Einstein and uh, and Schrodinger had to get help with the oh with their mathematics, yeah, and mathematics. Uh, you know, in, in, in both their their major uh, discoveries. So it's it's interesting. You, there are a lot gains and losses, as they say. Yeah, <laughs> indeed. So I thought they, it was worth maybe mentioning how he ended up in the in the exper in the experimental side of things. Uh, basically, he, this happened because he he when he when he finished his first degree, he decided he would do his his military service uh, because you could get away with one year military service if you agreed to be trained as an officer. But during this pr process, uh, during the time of this, his if you like rival, uh, although the rival isn't the right word, his friend uh, uh, Thuring in the same department. Uh, they were all they were out walking, uh, you know, hill walking, and he the, the friend fell over and broke his ankle, and so he couldn't do any. He was he was basically kept home, if you like, from any of these uh, adventures, and he was in a position to get the prime position of uh, doing his research with the uh, the high flying theoretician in the department, mm -hmm. and so then when. When uh, Schrodinger emerges from the the, yeah. the 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 army, if you like, all what's left is the experimental. But I think it I think it was a, I think it was a good thing for Schrodinger to do that. Yeah, it, it certainly worked out well yes. in the end. Hmm. So um, so yeah, uh, part four. Part three. Part three. Uh, oh, right, yes. <laughs> I'm skipping ahead here. Uh, so yeah. part three, we were talking about um, uh, Niels Bohr, who's another big figurehead in quantum physics or the history of quantum physics, but yes. a bit at odds with Schrodinger. Yeah. Um, uh, basically, uh, uh, when, the <clears throat> when he gets some... Um, uh, Gets his private docent, uh, 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 Schrodinger, then he has to go and get, you know, get a real job, paying job, and not only uh, that, but, but he's now married, and he he has a few part-time, short-term jobs uh, before he lands the big job, which is in Zurich, so you know, Zurich University, and this is the uh, so this period, this part three covers his time in Zurich and then latter time in Berlin where he gets on the basis of what the work that he did in Zurich, uh, mm -hmm. the, um, he gets the big job in Berlin. And this section is called the titled Making Waves. And this is the, the title of the book, of course, but this is the title of this particular, particular section. And so this is where he uh, did his biggest work That's during right. this time period, right? Yes, yeah, indeed. So uh, uh, and and of course he uh, he ends up uh, in conflict with Bohr, Bohr, Bohr uh, his uh, his approach to to uh, um, to quantum physics uh, is is different. Uh, Bohr has the if you like the majority. Everybody thinks that, that Bohr's approach is the is the correct one, and himself and and Einstein are are. Basically, the, the the skeptics. Mm -hmm. So it's another kind of it's a way of cementing the con relationship and connection between uh, Schrödinger and Einstein. So the 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 this this particular poem, uh, which is in the voice of um, of um, Niels Bohr, uh, basically the basic theme in it is the uh, the idea that uh, he he invite he's invited by Bohr to. When, by the time he gets to uh, to um, to Berlin and has become very famous, he uh, he is invited by by Bohr to come to Copenhagen and uh, to um, basically carry on the debate, if you like, and he which he does. Uh, but he shortly after he arrives, he he becomes ill. Schrödinger becomes ill and is, is, has, has has to take to the bed. Uh, he he stays in uh, Bohr's house. 
and Bor still keeps attacking him, even though he's, I mean, he's, he's feverish, he's, you know, he's, he's got some sort of bug or other, and Bor is in there hammering away at him about, it. but he's giving as good as he gets, you know, and it's all about this, the whole idea of the quantum jumps that, uh, that Bohr is, is famous for, that somehow or other the electron jumps between two levels uh, uh, and, uh, and that's how the, the energy is given out in the form of particular way of light or frequency of light. And this, anathema, this is anathema to, uh, to, to uh, Schrodinger that it has, there's no way that, it, that in, as a, from a physical point of view, I knew this is the, the idea, same idea that, you know, his understanding of physics as a, a rather than theoretical physics or, 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 or uh, that this doesn't make any sense at all. There are so many reasons why this should not be a, a viable model. So, so maybe I'm sorry, I've gone ahead of myself there, but I just, <laughs> I'll just read the poem uh, uh, under the title, Niels Bohr, physicist. He's feverish and taken to his bed where, bless her heart, Greta feeds him broth. I should have let him rest a while, Instead, I was, I'm told, unusually wroth. wroth. Nor was he willing to concede. Your jumps are gradual or summer, sudden. Either case gives problems only way of mechanics trumps. I counter that the problems then move base. And in the end, was anything resolved? If quantum jumps could be the winning bid, he would regret he ever got involved. I tell him we are grateful that he did. No apples fall unless you shake the tree. Witness young Heisenberg's uncertainty. So a few things possibly arising from that. Yeah, I, I mean, I didn't, hadn't heard of this. Uh... Bohr berating Schrodinger in bed and uh, although I could believe it you know I've been to some conferences and <laughs> seen how different physicists react to other physicists work it's uh it's believable um <clears throat> and this this whole issue of uh, quantum jumps or just the idea of I guess that's this is tied to the problem of measurements in quantum physics and for me that's a big thing and for all sort of people in, in physics it's still some sort of unknown you know in some ways schrodinger did a really good thing uh pushing forward physics but then opened it up, up a whole can of worms with uh you know all the issues that come with that and the sort of philosophical understanding or the lack of understanding that we have right now um <clears throat> and i i also realized so you, you mentioned no apples fall unless you shake the tree and uh I, I was thinking, talking about Schrodinger's equation or how you know I would describe it. It's actually I've got it behind me as well. Here, you can get a good look of Schrodinger's equation in light, and uh, it's it's kind of like the Newton's equation of um, of the microscopic world in a sense. It describes the dynamics, uh, and so you mentioned apples falling from the tree, and I thought, oh, that's like how, how you know the famous story of Newton coming up with gravity. <clears throat> um, you mentioned as well, uh, and in the, the, the blurb at the bottom there, about the play. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, tell, tell me a little bit, bit more about that. Um, well, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a play involving uh, uh, two, of the, two of the characters in, 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 the, in the bedroom, if you like, <laughs> but not a bedroom play. Uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, so it's Bohr and his wife Magreta, uh, and then Heisenberg as well. So that's, that's a, it, and it, it's, um, it's called Copenhagen, and it's set in the, a later period than, than the one where, if, if you look where we are at the moment, it's during the war, uh, Heisenberg is uh, working, supposed to be working on the, the atomic bomb project for, for Germany, uh, and, uh, and Bohr, Bohr is basically 
in, in an, his, his country is occupied and uh, and he sees the other side and so so there are a lot of issues about that about uh, you know in fact there's a lot of issues about them this took place as an actual meeting but there's a lot of issues about what actually the, the meeting was about and who's saying what and etc but in, I, I it's a wonderful play and if you ever get a chance to see it it's it's uh, I saw a version of it here in, in Dublin by the um, um, good heavens, what have I done? I've forgotten the name of the the, uh, the, the theatre company. It'll kill me. Uh, but uh, it was a, it was just excellent. And uh, there were two kind of things that uh, I, I remember so strongly about it. Uh, one was in the play itself, and that's when they're arguing. Uh, Bohr and Heisenberg are arguing about. You know, in some sense, that old argument: what is actually really going on? And and Heisenberg just and, and Bohr uses the word sense has to make sense, and Heisenberg says mathematics is sense. You know, and they're, they're, to some extent, that's those are the that's the nub of the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's a kind of a, a lesser uh, uh, meaningful. Uh, well, maybe it's meaningful in a different way. Um, I, I was lucky enough to 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 be asked to sit in as the the physics expert, which I wasn't in this area at all, really, but I, I, I agreed to do it. And there, there are a lovely bunch of people uh, in that uh, in that production. And um, so we were sat around the table as you do, you know, pre pre production. You sit around and you read the um, the script, and people say, "What was what does that mean?" And that you know. And at some stage, uh, uh, the Bohr character said to the to the uh, to the Heisenberg character, "Don't I don't quite get this bit, you know, because I would they would often, often occasionally ask me something, and I would try to explain. And, but he said it directed to his colleague, and he said, I 'Don't get this bit.' bit. And, and and the um, the the Heisenberg uh, character said back to him, uh, 'Don't worry about that bit. Nobody gets that bit.'" And and, uh, and that and uh, and I thought oh, yeah and uh, then the uh, surely or uh, the um, Bohr character said yeah but there'll be some nerd in an anorak in the audience who gets it yeah. and I said uh huh mm -mm. <laughs> so, so there you are it's a, it's a, but it's a wonderful it was a, it was a wonderful experience to be part of and also it's a it's a wonderful wonderful play Michael Friends uh, Copenhagen. Yes. Oh yes, in Copenhagen, that's where they're they're meeting, and yeah, just exactly. uh, the level of the, the prevalence of, of sort of Bohr's um, interpretation of quantum physics. That's that's what it's now called as well. It's the Copenhagen yes. interpretation, often called like the or related to the this idea of shut up and calculate is the the idea. Don't think about it too much. That's that's, that's right. how physicists coin it nowadays. <clears throat> So. so that so that was the period in his life where he released how many papers was it that were well in one big? year six in one year wow yeah yes and uh, and Heisenberg of course was doing coming at it from a different point of view and uh, it seems so very very different but in fact Schrodinger one of the Schrodinger's papers was to show that Heisenberg's approach and his were giving the same essentially the same thing. So yeah. it's hard to believe because they they they, look, they just look so different. One, yeah. one is basically uh, working with waves that uh, most of us are reasonably happy with, and he was dealing with matrices, uh, which yeah. different different world, but they, it's the same thing. Yeah, and and of course nowadays, uh, anyway, you know, we you teach them both, and you teach the similarities, and everyone sort of is on the same page now. There's less conflict. There. Yes. Um, so it all was resolved, I guess, in the end, up to a, an extent. Um, and so then moving into part four, so that was Schrodinger now with these six papers. Yes. I mean, and that's, that's true. I, I mean, he had, uh, after uh, he had, you know, really hit the big time with, uh, with the way of uh, equation and that, and then he was appointed to the, uh, to the uh, chair uh, to, to Planck's chair, Max Planck, who that my most unfortunate man, might, you might even say, you know, who had started the whole business of the, 
of of the of the quantum world and yet was most unhappy with yeah the same so anyway he 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 uh, uh he ended, he got Planck's chair largely through Planck's uh, uh, yeah work yeah yeah so I just realized the the, the time as well we're we're oh yes no, no, having no, a nice no. time chatting uh but uh all right we'll we'll we'll, we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll speak it up. <laughs> So uh, section four then is is basically, you know, he's in he's, he's in Berlin. Berlin has become a very dangerous place. Uh, uh, the Nazis are taking over, not taking over. Einstein leaves. Just says I've had enough, and uh, you know, well, he knew he was uh, under threat, and he's Jewish, and uh, and uh, and Schrödinger uh, Schrödinger decides to leave as well, but not because he was under threat. He just. Uh, and he was asked about this at, well, later, and he just said, "I've had a noseful of them." Was the, that was the expression? So, so he goes to Oxford. Uh, on the way to Oxford, he picks up the Nobel Prize, and that—that's uh, to say, the announcement is made on on the way. And when he arrives in Oxford, they, they greet him and saying, and with the news that he has a Nobel Prize. And then, in that typically uh, English Oxford way, they, they, the president of Magdalen College, where he's to, he's to stay. Uh, says, uh, but we assumed that you already had the Nobel Prize. Is it to say we wouldn't take you? We wouldn't take you if you hadn't got the Nobel Prize. <laughs> so, but anyway, so he doesn't really care for uh, Oxford at all. It, uh, it's um, he sees it as a misogynist, and uh, he doesn't like the way they teach and things like that. So, uh, but the um, uh, the uh, basically the poem that you've chosen uh, from this this section is fact. Is 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 Einstein? Is that correct? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, well, yes, we could do Einstein, and, uh, and I also uh, like the Fermi, the Fermi, Fermi, Fermi poem as well. But um, yeah. Um, so yes, Einstein, uh, as I say, is now by, is, is now in America at Princeton, and uh, he's his poem in his poem he's looking back to the good days in Berlin, and then he's talking as well about the. Uh, the, um, this famous paper, the EPR paper, that is going to change uh, history, physics history as well. So Albert Einstein, I would have bet a dollar to a dime that he would seize upon my merry caper with what the world of physics will in time retitle simply the EPR paper. He coins entanglement, and I don't mind that few remember Einstein's paradox based on gunpowder running off to find his cat dead and alive inside the box. I had so much enjoyed our Berlin days, both for his physics and our friendly chats. God moves like photons in mysterious ways, but why in God's name would he favour grants? I pray that when he gets his pleasant house, he is indeed the cat and not the mouse. So I guess the, the closing thing there is that uh, Schrodinger, fed up with Oxford, goes to Graz in Austria, goes home to Austria, but he goes to the one university which is totally uh, um, um, aligned with the, not totally, but strongly aligned with the fascist, fascist movement. So Einstein is saying, why would you do, why would you do that? Yeah. <clears throat> and I also, you know, uh, we mentioned before about the, the two aligning, but on, on physics. Yes. And um, they both sharing the same sort of skepticism with regards to the way people were interpreting quantum physics at the time. Um, and you, and of course there was Schrodinger's famous uh, uh, cat thought experiment um, to sort of highlight the absurdity of how people were talking about quantum physics. And Einstein, you know, liked the way that Schrodinger thought about it. But uh, yeah, you mentioned that Einstein had some sort of other thought experiment that maybe predated Schrodinger's in some way. That's 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 correct. Uh, uh, but it has essentially the same. I mean, you could say that in some ways, Schrodinger's is a, just a kind of a, uh, I don't know, 
hyped up version of the original. Yeah. yeah. But it's just the idea that there will be, a, if you have a, a, a pile of gunpowder and, and on average uh, gunpowder explodes after a certain point of time. Mm -hmm. And once you reach that sort of time point, if you like, then it's in this, uh, according to quant the quantum physics, then uh, it has both exploded and unexploded. In the same yeah. way, the cat is both dead and alive. Yeah. So, yeah. so it is, it's, I think it's just that, but it's clearly it's, it's so the, the cat one is so much more uh, engaging. Uh, it struck with you, yeah. It struck yeah. with people more in some way. Yeah. Absolutely, uh, and uh, and it's used. I, I understand it's still used uh, as a as a kind of a, a test of certain things being said about quantum physics. It says, yeah, yeah, um, and it, there's sort of different variations on it now uh, yeah. to to sort of highlight weirdness of quantum physics and or just. The weirdness as Schrodinger would put it, how people were interpreting what was sure. real in, in fact. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> sorry, just to, there's probably more things we could talk about there, uh, but maybe we should continue on. Right. Well, uh, uh, he, he doesn't stay very long in Graz uh, because uh, the Anschluss happens, everything changed in Austria, all the Jewish professors uh, are fired and lucky to get away with their lives and the uh, but he's 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 sort of sort of safe except that the the nazis haven't forgotten the fact that he went to oxford <laughs> uh you know because it, that they saw that as a kind of a, a slur and in the end he's given a, a, a he's given the, the a choice or not no choice he said you better write a letter a public letter apol essentially apologizing for being who you are uh, and it's called a confession to the to the Führer, which he does. It's printed in the paper, and mm. shortly afterwards they fire him anyway. So, yeah. oh. so he has to he has to get out. Um, uh, they are not prepared to let him out in any easy way, uh, and certainly, uh, and he has nowhere to go anyway. So, but at the same time, uh, then moves are being made to um, basically. De Valera has uh, appeared on the scene, not physically, but uh, looking for uh, a, a hotshot physicist to launch effectively the Dublin Institute of Advanced Studies. So the uh, the second poem that you wanted from this section, I think, was Enrico Fermi. Fermi, yeah. Right. And he was, Fermi was on one, one, just one more stop on the way out. So they were able to go from from uh, from Graz uh, uh, to um, to Rome, and then from Rome they could get to Geneva, uh, and then through there they would be able ultimately through a very torturous other elements of journey, uh, it, they would end up in in Dublin. So, will I read the uh, for me? Oh. Yes, yes, please. Yeah. We last met at the Solway conference in Brussels just before his Nobel Prize. Now he's a fugitive without two cents. I lent him money, careful to advise him not to write from Rome, too dangerous with censors hard at work. The Vatican was happy to oblige him without fuss, for after all, he is the Pope's own man. Contact with de Valera led in haste their embassy to give them both one pound and first class tickets. With no time to waste, waste, I came to see them off, Geneva bound. And three months later, with my family, the Nobel Prize was our own chance to flee. So he was, a, he was somehow or other part of that network. I think I think you could almost say that Solvay Conference was a network of people, mm -hmm. like-minded uh, people interested in, in, in quantum physics. And they would, you know, it wasn't a very large number of people. And so I'd say the, the collections were very strong and, and, uh, and personal. Yeah. So uh, the uh, Fermi would be very more than willing to, you know, to help out to get Schrodinger out and away. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, 
just coming through physics education material that Fermi is you know another big name in quantum physics but then to find out that they were all you know so close and helping each other out like this is uh is, yeah really interesting mm. and then Fermi you're saying went on to win a Nobel Prize as well he, he did that's correct yes yeah uh, and also use that opportunity to vamoose yeah yeah no, I mean quite it's quite extraordinary really yeah and there was an interesting story there or uh, about um, how De Valera was even able to contact. Yes, that's right. Uh, the, um, the, it was, a, they couldn't write to Schrodinger directly. That, that, I mean, uh, the, 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 the Nazi authorities would have been, I mean, God, we're not sure what would have happened to Schrodinger if that had happened. So he, I suppose relying on his old uh, his old days as a as a message sender of of secret c contents uh, during mm -hmm. the War of Independence, uh, they had this long link, uh, long, long chain of of connections, which allowed them to deposit a, a short letter from uh, uh, from De Valera to uh, Schrodinger's mother-in-law, uh, and. Uh, who then was able to give it to uh, to the to the to to Schrodinger himself, pass it on to Schrodinger himself, and then if any of them had been caught with it, it would have been a, a problem, a real serious problem. And so they, uh, you know, so and of course the instructions were burn this as soon as you read this, and yeah, so. Yeah. That uh, that's a nice tie-in as well, I think, to the, the the last poem that we decided to choose. Yes. Part five. Uh, that's part five, and part five is basically he's in Dublin with all the the class connections and and, and one, enjoying. In fact, the title of this uh, this section is is the happiest days, and that's a direct quote from uh, from Schrodinger himself. He described the, the the seventeen years in Dublin as the happiest happiest days. Yeah, as as we all do, as we all do. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, yeah, and he's um, uh, the, the poem is uh, is as you say it's a uh, Schrodinger. I don't know, excuse me, it's Eamon de Valera. He's looking back. He he's uh, at, you know at some of that past history, but the whole section of the of the of this of this of the book is about the time at, in Dublin, followed by the shorter time in in Vienna when he retires from from Dublin. So, Eamon de Valera. I dreamt of Princeton by the Irish Sea, where high Mathesis and the Fianna swap legends of the past and future, free of worldly cares to probe their arcana. I thought to start off with two local greats, but Whitaker advised another play, a case of it's an ill wind that the fates and fascism could blow him in our way. My rebel training came in handy here, from born to bear to some Dutchman, no name, to Annie's mother, message inked in fear, is read, agreed, and then put to the flame. And here he is, lodged on Kinkora Road, my eyes averted from that rare abode. So this is a case of where the, the three standard bits and pieces of information are then caught with the, the last two lines <laughs> that we're in, a very yeah. different, we're in a very different world with the last two lines. Yeah. <clears throat> And you mentioned there as well the the rebel training coming in handy again. Yes, yes. Um, also the the first line there. So that was what started it all off. Uh, Dias, this, this uh, devil ear liking the idea of what they had with Princeton, the Princeton Institute for Advanced Studies. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess the devil era himself was also interested in mathematics and. Oh, absolutely. Uh, I mean that's the that's the key key thing to the, to the Dias project. I have to say. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. 
the, the rumors are there was the start, anecdotes are that uh, he was particularly interested in quaternion, mm -hmm. quaternion algebra. Uh, this is Hamilton's uh, algebra, and uh, the uh, the rumor is that he used to ring up Trinity College <laughs> late at night. <laughs> looking for help with a particular knotty uh, quaternions problem. Uh, I'm not sure if that's entirely true, but he was certainly yeah. close to one particular uh, um, uh, professor in the, um, in, the, in the mathematics department in Trinity. Yeah. So, uh, yes. And of course, he was interested in Celtic studies as well. You know? So this is the marriage, the perfect yes, marriage yeah, to be. Yeah. of uh, theoretical physics and, uh, and uh, Celtic studies. Uh, and I think maybe you think people should make more of that, you know. Yeah, yeah. Particularly at, particularly at Samhain. Samhain is when the, the theoretical physics and, 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 and um, Celtic studies actually get together. Yeah. Just for, just for one night. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, it'd be great to talk more, but I'm, uh, I think we're, we actually have to close quickly at two. Sure. Yes. So, um, I just want to say a few closing words then. Um, I mean, uh, yeah, thank you very much for coming along, Iggy, and, and uh, giving us the readings of your poems. And uh, your, your book is now available, Making Waves. Um, <clears throat> people uh, will be able to find that, I guess, if uh, it's linked from, from our website and everything. Um, I want to also share a couple of slides uh, on um, a program that we're that's uh, coming along, uh, creating our future, um, <clears throat> which is a government of Ireland campaign uh, to stimulate a conversation, a national conversation, um, hopefully generating ideas from the public on what sort of research questions we can uh, <clears throat> investigate. Anyone you know, watching this or knows anybody who has any ideas and suggestions for future research questions, um, you're, you can, your idea can be based on an opportunity or challenge you see for yourself or the community that you're in, Ireland or even the world. And uh, if you have a topic or an idea that you're passionate about, then this is the, the place to go submit it.